Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tolkoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video and the next two or three videos, we're going to be talking about the shoulder joint, which is also called the glenohumeral joint. This joint's a little more complicated than some of the others that we've seen in the past, so it's going to span a couple videos at least. So glenohumeral joint, another word for the shoulder joint, the way it gets its name is it's an articulation between the humerus, distally, so here's the humerus, and the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity. So here's the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity of the scapula. Remember that the glenoid fossa really lies on the lateral aspect of the neck of the scapula. And so the head of the humerus is gonna fit right in there in the glenoid fossa. Now, this joint automatically, because of the nature of its structure, is a ball and socket synovial joint. So when it's a synovial joint, we're gonna have a lot of structures there we'll look at in the next few slides, maybe in the next video. But it's also going to be a ball and socket joint. Now one thing I want you to notice about this, and you can actually tell in this picture, is that if you look at the head of the humerus, its size relative to the glenoid cavity, you might be able to tell that the head of the humerus is pretty large relative to the size of the glenoid cavity. So when we talk about the glenohumeral joint, not only is it synovial, it's also a ball and socket, but it's also an articulation between the large convex head of the humerus and the shallow concave glenoid fossa or cavity. Okay? Um, that's gonna come to play in a few minutes. Um, we'll talk about why. But it suffices to say really that both of these surfaces are covered in articular cartilage. Remember that's hyaline cartilage to help reduce friction at the joint. Now, here's an important thing. The glenoid cavity is very shallow relative to the large head of the humerus. Okay? This is going to result in a couple of consequences. We're actually going to skip down here um, and talk about this first before we talk about the labrum. So the head of the humerus is very large. We've already talked about that. If you have a really large head of the humerus sitting in a very shallow joint cavity, um, that doesn't appear to be very stable. And in general, when we talk about stability and mobility of joints, if we have low stability, that tends to mean we have high mobility. And so the glenohumeral joints can have a very small glenoid fossa for a looser fit of the humeral head. In other words, this joint's going to have pretty low stability and much more mobility. So glenohumeral joint sacrifices stability for more mobility. Very important. And one thing is that is very different than the hip joint or the iliofemoral joint. So even though the hip joint and the shoulder joint are the same type of joint, they are very, very different. Okay? The iliofemoral or the hip joint, which is an articulation between the ilium, the acetabulum, and the femur, the head of the femur, we have a large acetabulum for a very tight fit of the femoral head. Remember the acetabulum was very large okay, relative to the size of the femur's head. So therefore the hip joint, if we compare it to the glenohumeral joint, the hip joint is going to have much more stability and less mobility. And if you think about this logically, it makes sense. Think about the mobility you have at your hip joint versus your shoulder. The shoulder is much more mobile. And the main reason it's more mobile is because you have a very large humeral head and a very shallow socket, which is the glenoid cavity. That also makes the shoulder much more prone to dislocations than the hip joint because it's more mobile, less stable. So the bottom line there is that the shoulder is an extremely mobile joint. Now, obviously, you want there to be some added stability to the shoulder joint. You don't want it to be super, super mobile. Otherwise, you're going to have really big problems with dislocations. So what the glenoid cavity also has to at least get some added stability is it has a fibrocartilaginous ligament called the glenoid labrum. This is really important. The glenoid labrum is a very, very strong ligament that wraps around the glenoid cavity and increases the depth of the glenoid cavity. And so when the head of the humerus sits in it, it artificially creates a deeper cavity. So the glenoid fossa by itself is very shallow, but if you wrap the labrum around it, it actually artificially increases that depth and allows a slightly tighter fit for the head of the humerus. Okay? So that glenoid labrum is, is, is very important. So it deepens the shallow socket of the glenoid fossa for a tighter fit. Now, we've talked about this in previous videos, that the biceps brachii, that is the long head of the biceps brachii, 
and the lateral head of the triceps brachii insert on the glenoid cavity. Remember this tubercle up here at the top, the superglenoid tubercle, is one of the origins of the long head of the biceps brachii. Down here, the infraglenoid tubercle is the origin of the lateral head of the triceps brachii. What's also interesting is that the labrum that wraps around the glenoid fossa, okay, those two tendons of biceps brachii, long head, and triceps brachii, lateral head, also partially fuse not only with the tubercles, but they also fuse with the glenoid labrum, which also gives those some added stability as well. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. A few other things here. Um, first of all, here on the near the head of the humerus, here's the greater tubercle. Here is the lesser tubercle. And remember, we have a transverse humeral ligament spanning between them. And those two tubercles, if we follow them down, here's the greater tubercle. Down here, we have the lateral lip of the intertubercular groove. Over here would be the medial lip of the intertubercular groove, and of course between them is the intertubercular groove or the intertubercular sulcus, sometimes also called the bicipital groove. We'll talk about that again much later. But notice again that this long head of the biceps brachii tendon not only goes through that intertubercular groove, but it actually goes underneath this transverse humeral ligament. And obviously the tendon's been cut here, but if we were to follow that tendon, we can see it actually originating on that superglenoid tubercle, and if that labrum was there, we would see it actually partially fuse with that labrum. So for this slide, the bottom line here to really get out of it is that you've got a very large humeral head, very shallow glenoid fossa or glenoid socket, and so you have a situation where the shoulder joint is going to have much more mobility, much less stability, okay? um, and that's the opposite of what we see at the iliofemoral joint, which is the hip. But to get a little bit more stability there, the glenoid fossa will have a labrum okay, that wraps around it to increase its depth to at least get some stability out of it. Here's a frontal section of the glenohumeral joint. Okay, we obviously know this is the humerus over here. Here's the head of the humerus. Okay, um, over here, this is the neck of the scapula, and you can see on the lateral side of the neck, we have the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity. Now you'll notice both the glenoid fossa, which is concave, and the head of the humerus, which is convex, they're both coated with articular cartilage, which remember is of hyaline type. And that, of course, creates the joint cavity, which is the space between those two articular surfaces. Right? Now over here, this is actually the tendon of long head of biceps brachii. Again, if we were looking at this without the frontal section, we'd see the transverse humeral ligament going over that between the greater and lesser tubercles. But if we follow this long head of the biceps brachii tendon, we actually see there's a couple synovial sheaths that actually encompass it on either side and go around it. So the tendon, as it loops around the top of the head of the humerus, it's surrounded by these synovial sheaths, which is very important for reducing friction and also providing stability as the tendon wraps around here. And you can see as it wraps around, it's going to, ins it's going to originate here on the superglenoid tubercle of the glenoid fossa. Okay? Also, this is one part of the glenoid labrum. Again, since we took a frontal section, we can't see much of it, but it would essentially go around in a circle around the glenoid fossa. We can see the glenoid labrum right here. Here is part of it inferiorly. But we can actually see that this tendon of long head of biceps partially originates off of that glenoid labrum. And as it descends down through here, it'll eventually reach its muscular part and fuse with that of the short head of biceps brachii. Also, if we look down here, we have this axillary pouch. Now, we're going to look at some ligaments later, and we'll see which one this is. Uh, this is actually the inferior glenohumeral ligament. But it, notice that it's actually very loose down here at the bottom. That's very important because you have a very mobile joint. You want to have some slack in there to provide uh, some means for that movement. If this was really tight, if you tried to abduct your shoulder, there would actually be some limitations in the range of motion because you'd end up using up all the slack here and it'd be very taut and you wouldn't be able to move it further. So you have some slack here in this part of the joint capsule. And this slack here of the joint capsule actually creates a little bit more space down here in the cavity. And this part of the cavity is called the axillary pouch. Again, if you were to abduct the shoulder, um, this would actually start to tighten a little bit. But because it's already loose, you actually can get full range of motion during abduction especially. Okay? It'll also play a role in things like lateral flexion, lateral extension, and so on and so forth. Okay?
So this will be the last slide that we look at in this video, and then in the following video we'll pick up with intrinsic ligaments of the glenohumeral joint. Let's get a feel for some of the other structures that are around the glenohumeral joint that we may have seen. Here's the clavicle right here. Here's the acromial end of the clavicle, and here's the acromial process. So this right here is the acromioclavicular ligament. That's one of the three ligaments stabilizing the AC joint. These other two ligaments right here that stabilize it are both coracoclavicular ligaments, but it has two parts. The more laterally placed trapezoid part, or trapezoid ligament, and the more medially placed curved one called the conoid ligament that both connect the coracoid process to the clavicle and those three ligaments collectively stabilize that AC joint. Okay, So here's our coracoid process, acromial process or acromion, and then we have this ligament that spans between them which does not stabilize the AC joint. It's called the coracoacromial ligament, and what it actually does is it completes the coracoacromial arch, okay, or the subacromial arch. That's an arch that consists of the acromial process, the coracoid process, and then this coracoacromial ligament between them. So you have a complete arch here. And one of the functions of this arch is to limit uh, translation of the humerus upward. If it goes up too far, guess what happens? You have a dislocation. Now you can obviously still have dislocations because it's an extremely mobile joint, but the presence of this arch right here, the coracoacromial arch or subacromial arch, um, it basically limits the amount of dislocation and limits the upward translation of the humerus so that it makes it more difficult for it to dislocate from the glenoid fossa. Also the space underneath here called the subacromial space is a space between the top of the head of the humerus and of course the coracoacromial arch or subacromial arch. Alright so here down at the bottom of the glenohumeral joint capsule this is the axillary pouch that we talked about. Here's the transverse humeral ligament that spans between the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. And again, you can see here part of the intertubercular groove. The transverse humeral ligament basically turns that intertubercular groove or intertubercular sulcus or bicipital groove as it's often called into an intertubercular canal. And so we can see the tendon of long head of biceps brachii go through that intertubercular groove and then underneath the transverse humeral ligament where it'll eventually curve around up here and then insert or I should say originate really on the superglenoid tubercle of the glenoid fossa. Okay. Here we have the coracohumeral ligament. The coracohumeral ligament is actually a part of what we call the rotator interval or it's contained in the rotator interval and its integrity is important for shoulder movements. We'll cover this um, a little bit later. You can also see here some capsular ligaments um, capsular ligaments are, are a type of intrinsic ligament that we're going to pick up with and talk about in the next video. But these are essentially going to be really on the inside of the joint capsule, even though they appear to be on the outside here. But these are capsular ligaments. And in general, the major ligaments, at least that we can see here, that are going to stabilize the glenohumeral joint are going to be the coracohumeral ligament and then also these capsular ligaments. Okay. As you can see here, we're going to be covering those intrinsic ligaments starting in the next video. Hopefully this video gave you a good introduction and understanding of the glenohumeral joint. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.